I greet you uh, on this communion morning in the name of the one that is in the Eastern or in the Orthodox Church, sometimes called the Pantukrator, which means the creator of everything. When you look at the Gospel according to John, you will find it's slightly different than the other three Gospels in the way it describes Jesus and his ministry. And one of the focuses that John has is the fact that Jesus was the Word, and through the Word, God created everything. So I greet you with the words from John's Gospel. Before the world was created, the Word already existed. He was with God, and He was the same as God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. The Word was the source of life, and this life brought light to mankind. Shall we pray? Dear God, you have made yourself known to us as creator and sustainer of all that is. In Jesus, your Son, you have revealed your undying love for each one of us. As we enter this season of Lent, help us to reflect on your words in the Scriptures and give us the faith and courage to follow Jesus in the way of care 
and compassion in the way of active engagement with the world for justice and mercy to enable fullness of life to each human being. Save us from the temptation of making gods of our comfort or our possessions or our status, misusing the power we hold over others. Rather, God, guide us by your Spirit to a deeper understanding of our joyful dependence on your love and the joy of living in community with one another. These things we ask through our Saviour and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading is from Exodus chapter 34. When Moses went down from Mount Sinai carrying the Ten Commandments, his face was shining because he'd been speaking with the Lord, but he did not know it. Aaron and all the people looking at Moses and saw that his face was shining, and they were afraid to go near him. But Moses called them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the community went to him, and Moses spoke with them. After that, all the people of Israel gathered around him, and Moses gave them all the laws that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he covered his face with a veil. Whenever Moses went into the tent of the Lord's presence to speak to the Lord, he would take the veil off. When he came out, he would tell the people of Israel everything that he had been commanded to say, and they would see that his face was shining. Then he would put the veil back on until the next time he went to speak with the Lord. Our second reading is from Hebrews chapter 4. Let us then hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne, where there is grace. There we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it. Amen. Prayer is 
the oxygen of our faith. For without it, one's faith will suffocate. But through prayer, one's spirit experiences a vitality, a life-giving energy that enables one to live your life as present as possible. Yes, I believe that prayer is oxygen to our faith. Prayer is to the health of your spirituality what community is, what communication rather is to a healthy marriage. When couples communicate honestly, wholeheartedly, regularly, respectfully, then odds are that relationship will be a healthy, long-lasting, mutually satisfying relationship. But without communication, relationships start to stagnate and eventually grow cold and sometimes even die. Similarly, prayer is vitally critical to a healthy walk with God. As we are about to start a five-week journey together, focusing on prayer, I should tell you that I am in no way a master at prayer. I do not have a black belt in intercession. I do not have calluses on my knees. Well, if I have, it's from rugby, but I don't have it from praying regularly. And disciplined prayer, so nor do I have a prayer journal that would be the envy of the beautiful people of thy own community. What I do have, though, is the example of Jesus, just like you have the same example. And there is much that we can learn together from Jesus about prayer. I also have the Bible as a wonderful witness to the breadth and depth of prayer and of people for whom prayer was an integral part of their walk with the living God. The same Bible that you have and that we will be looking in to learn from those prayer masters. The same Bible that contains wonderful prayers that we call the Psalms. I also have some lived experiences of what prayer has meant and has impacted in my own life and the life of people I have had the privilege to journey with, as I believe you also have. Now, there are many people wise in the ways and nature of prayer, much wiser than I am, and I will every week share with you an author or a book that I believe is really worth reading. So if you... Uh, are the reading type, or if you want to listen to this in audible, uh, in an audio version, um, may I suggest Timothy Keller's book, Dr. Tim Keller, on prayer called Experiencing Awe and Intimacy with God. What Tim Keller does in this book is to, he, he comes at prayer from two different angles. On the one hand, um, he focuses on a sense of awe for the wonderful greatness and majesty of God, the God that we worship, the God that we pray to. So very much a God that can act, a God that does care in ways and in levels that blow our minds. And on the other hand, he explains prayer as a sense of intimacy, of closeness and personal engagement that highlights the personal, caring, involved nature of our relationship with God that is enhanced by and experienced through prayer. So awe and majesty on the one side, and on the other side, close intimacy and personal involvement. Two important, though differentiated, characteristics of healthy prayer. So as we start our collective journey today, learning more about prayer, I believe it is important that we know what prayer is at its core. What is the minimum essence of prayer? Would you say that prayer is a religious activity? You might say yes and no. Is prayer a discipline? Yes. And no. Is prayer a means of getting God to do your bidding? 
No, I don't think so. Is prayer something that only people who are trained in prayer can do? Definitely not. What prayer is, at its core, is a conversation. So when thinking about prayer and the way prayer is described to us in the Bible and in the life of people who were uh, masters at prayer, people whose prayer life were integral to their spirituality, prayer is at its heart a conversation. A conversation between you and God. So if nothing else, if after five weeks you come away thinking, you know what, I, there's only one thing I remember, and that is prayer is a conversation. You might think that sounds too simple or too informal, but it really is neither, because God is neither impressed with complexity nor with formality. We might be, or the system might be, but God is not. God is impressed by only two things. Do you know what impresses God? Have a look at the times Jesus was impressed by something. It's either real faith or active compassion. It's not formality and uh, it's definitely not with anyone thinking God should be impressed by us. Quite the contrary. Jesus and the prophets of the Old Testament make it clear when talking about prayer that God does not like empty pomp and ceremony, nor repetition, nor a hullabaloo for the sake of it. Neither does God want self-righteous approaches by people thinking that we deserve God's attention because we've worked so hard at impressing God. No, if you want to pray, then simply have an honest, heart-to-heart -heart conversation with God. God listens intently when we talk with God sincerely. That might possibly explain why sometimes it's so difficult for us to pray when other people are present. Because it's important for us not to look bad in front of other people. It's dangerous to have other people know our shortcomings and our secret passions and our insecurities. We know we can't hide it from God, but it's not the type of thing that we necessarily would share with one another, which I reckon is to a large extent what makes it difficult to pray spontaneously with others in such a heartfelt way. It's not impossible, but it does require a sense of trust and community amongst participants. Now, when I say it's a conversation, um, bear in mind that it's somebody that you want to have a conversation with. It's, it's a welcoming conversation. And it's like having a conversation with your best, best lifelong friend. If that's your spouse, then like your spouse, except much more. But note that it is not a monologue. It is a two-way conversation. I, right, you might say. So, Alan, how often do you hear God audibly speak to you? Have you remembered to take your tablets? Right. Do you see any writings on the wall then? So how can you say it's a two-way conversation? Where I do hear God talking to me is through all I know of God, predominantly from the Bible. So when I converse with God, I can almost guess, I can almost know or feel, sense what God's reply would be. If I were to find my wife now and ask her, honey, not that I ever call her honey, um, but if I were to phone her and, and ask her, you see, um, I really love old Land Rovers, especially Defender Land Rovers. I would really want to buy one. I can see a lot of use for it, really. 
I can honestly see I need that Land Rover and I can put it to good use, etc., etc. I know what she will say because she has told me before, in no uncertain terms, no way are you spending all that time and money and emotion on something that you and I both know you will you and I both know will need your ongoing attention. I know how she feels about old defenders. So when I develop my relationship with God through spending time in the Word of God, taking my Bible reading or even my Bible study series, then the better I will be able to understand the character, the thoughts and passions of God. If I have this conversation with Esti over the phone, I know what she'll say even before she answers me. I shouldn't ask that. We've had that conversation. <clears throat> so it's the same in our relationship with God. When we converse with God, there is a clear sense of what God's will will be or there should be. And in a time like we are going into Lent, where we see Jesus in the 40 days in the wilderness, that is a time of focusing on what does God really want? What is God really like? I have to be able to discern my passions and the world's passions from God's passions. It might align, but it does definitely not necessarily. There is also a tugging of the Spirit of God in my conscience affirming in my heart through the compass true north of Christ and compassion. So when I am conversing with God in all honesty, with God and with myself, and if I know God through a lifelong developing relationship, then it definitely is not a monologue, but rather a conversation. Now if prayer is a conversation, what type of conversation is it? Or rather, what's the relationship between these two partners in the conversation, these participants? Is it an adversarial one? In other words, are they two enemies or competitors trying to compel one another to submit to one another's will? Are they strangers to one another? Or is there a significant power imbalance between the two? In that one has and knows everything and the other is the opposite, clueless and completely hopeless. Not if I understand the Bible correctly. The example of Moses or Elijah or Job or Jesus or the writers of the Psalms or even Mary, the mother of Jesus. What I see there is that the two conversation partners care about one another. They respect one another. They have an affinity, a kind of love towards one another. In that sense, prayer is a conversation where both partners want to talk with one another. They want to hear what the other one's heart is and really want the well-being of the other party. It is like being invited to a coffee shop by an old friend. Not like being called to the headmaster's office for a caning. So prayer is a conversation between two parties who love one another. How do I know that? Well, to be honest, when it comes to your love or my love towards God, I cannot speak for you. Only you can. I do not know whether you love God or whether you only fear God. But if I understand Jesus' words in John's Gospel, then we need not fear God, for true love drives out fear. Fear is only in order when punishment is expected. And Jesus has taken every and all types of punishment that could have come our way for whatever we did or will do wrong. All the evil in my and your heart has been dealt with when we approach God through the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus. As for God's love for us, we can know that God loves us because God so loved the world that he laid down his own life for me and you. I know that I know that I know that God loves me without limits. God is absolutely gracious and kind and compassionate and caring towards us. God delights in our engaging with him in prayer. Just like the scripture in Hebrews says, we can have confidence to be in God's presence. Even more so 
than Moses had. But when talking about this welcoming attitude of God towards your and my honest prayers, Jesus uniquely and passionately defined the type of loving relationship that God has with us and that we can have with God. And when we understand this basic principle of prayer, it can really open up so much depth and breadth and joy and growth in our relationship with God. For prayer is a conversation. It is a conversation between two parties who care about one another deeply. And the specifics of the relationships, relationship that these two conversation parties have is one of a wonderful parent with a beloved child. One of the great insights that Jesus shared with humanity is that God is a parent, a loving, caring, engaging parent. Jesus, as you well know, addresses God as Father. And he invites us to do the same. In so many of Jesus' parables and teachings, he shows his followers that, Jesus, that God is a Father. His Father, our Father. That was truly revolutionary for those days. At best, the gods back then were only considered to be a father to the Pharaoh or the king, but not to us mere mortals. And in the case of Judaism, the concept of God, the God of Israel as being a father, to the level of being able to love him like a dad, a personally engaged, present parent, that was unfathomable. But Jesus shows us the Father heart of God. Just think of that image of the parable of the prodigal son. It's actually the parable of the loving father. We get hung up with the prodigal son. But it's the parable of the loving father. When Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray to our father. That really is revolutionary. So what we have is we have a conversation between a wonderful parent and a much-loved child. Now, just in case you think the difference in holiness between God and yourself is too great to allow you to call him or to understand him as an engaging, endearing parent, you are right. The distance, the difference, the magnitude is too large to be able to cross. God is too holy and too great and too powerful and too otherworldly to allow us to enter into the creator of the universe's presence, the original entity's presence, except if that source of love and light and life and beauty and power actually invites us in and makes us worthy and able to be in God's presence. And that is what the life and death and ministry and resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about. That is why we are celebrating communion. That is why the Eucharist, the communion, the Lord's Supper, the sharing of the bread, the sharing of the wine is a feast that is celebrated, not a sacrifice that is being suffered. Our sharing in what Jesus Christ has already achieved is what we are doing when we share in the eating of the bread, Jesus' body, and the drinking of the wine, the cup of the new covenant. These are the tangible symbols of our being welcomed into the very presence of the supreme ultimate being, the God of the universe, the creator and the sustainer of all that is, Simultaneously, our loving and caring parent that welcomes you in for a coffee chat whenever you are ready. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you for your love. Holy Spirit, will you please make all of these a reality in our lives, in our relationships, and in our prayers. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. I invite the elders, John, Christine, to come to the front. Let us pray. Holy God, loving Father of all peoples, we pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, for their countries and their leaders. We pray for all those who are afraid that your everlasting arms hold them in this time of great fear. We pray for all those who have the power over life and death, that they will choose for all people life and life and do in all its fullness. We pray for those who choose war, that they will remember that you direct your people to turn our swords into plowshares and seek for peace. We pray for leaders on the world stage, that they were, are inspired by the wisdom and courage of Christ. 
Above all, Lord, today we pray for peace for Ukraine. Lord, have mercy. We also pray, Lord, that your name will be honoured, that your name will not be abused by leaders to further selfish causes, that your kingdom will come, that you will be done in Russia and in Ukraine as in heaven. Please give the, the Ukrainian refugees their daily bread and also for the refugees from Syria and Somalia and all the war torn regions of the world. Forgive us our daily sins and our lack of compassion, just as we forgive those who treat us unkindly or with indifference. Lead us not into the temptation of apathy, but deliver us from self-centeredness, for you are the ultimate ruler. We pray this because of your love to all in Jesus Christ. Amen. The blessing for today is a Ukrainian blessing. God bless you with freedom. God bless you with wisdom. Guiding you into a kind world. Bless us, O Lord, with grace forever and evermore.